Welcome to the Play Podcast with me, Douglas Schatz. Hello, and welcome to episode six of the Play Podcast, where we explore the greatest new and classic plays. I'm Douglas Schatz, founder and host of the Play Podcast. For our play today, the curtain rises on the interior of a pub. It is noon, one day in the spring of 1977. Emma, age 38, is sitting at a corner table. Jerry, 40, approaches with drinks, a pint of bitter for him, a glass of wine for her. He sits. They smile, toast each other silently, drink. He sits back and looks at her. This is the opening, or perhaps I say ending, of Harold Pinter's play, Betrayal. Although this is the first scene of the play, it is the last in the story of the affair between Emma and Jerry, a story that we will see played out in reverse chronological order over the course of the play. Betrayal was written in 1977-78 and premiered at the National Theatre in 1978, directed by Peter Hall and with a cast including Penelope Wilton, Michael Gambon, and Daniel Massey. It has gone on to be performed numerous times around the world, often with the most stellar casts, including, for example, Rachel Weiss and Daniel Craig on Broadway in 2013, and most recently last year with Tom Hiddleston, Zawe Hashton, and Charlie Cox, directed as part of Jamie Lloyd's season of Pinter at the Pinter Theatre in London. The play has also been made into a film in 1983 with a screenplay by Pinter himself, starring Jeremy Irons, Ben Kingsley, and Patricia Hodge. To help us explore one of Pinter's most popular works, I'm joined on a video link by a Pinter expert, Dr. Mark Taylor Batten. Mark is a senior lecturer in theater studies at Leeds University. His key areas of interest include the career of Harold Pinter, the theatricality of Samuel Beckett, and 20th century French and British theater. He is a co-editor of the Matthew and Drama Engage series of books, and most appropriately for our purposes, he's the author of two books on Harold Pinter, The Theater of Harold Pinter, published by Bloomsbury, and about Pinter, the playwright and the work, published by Faber and Faber. He is also a director of the Harold Pinter Society. Welcome, Mark. Thanks very much for joining us. Thank you. With all of the time that you've devoted to studying the life of Harold Pinter, I'm fascinated to know where and when you first encountered his work, and what about that experience turned you on to him? I first encountered his work at school, at high school. We had a remarkable drama teacher who introduced us to all sorts of materials that probably were you know, a little bit dodgy uh, in some ways. Uh, he, he pulls no punches anyway. So Samuel Beckett, Peter Schaffer, lots of stuff with swearing and nudity. And, and then one, one day he put together an evening of, of short plays. And that was the first time I met Pinter. It wasn't a particularly controversial piece of Pinter. It was Trouble at Work. So I don't know if you know, it's a short sketch. And it was hilarious. And I, I'd heard of Pinter as being this dark, kind of mysterious, uh, difficult to penetrate kind of writer. And here we were doing this hilarious piece of comedy. And so after that, I discovered, you know, the caretaker and, and the birthday party as part of the curriculum at school and, and then, then on in university. Because I got very heavily attached to Samuel Beckett through this drama teacher, Harold Pinter always kind of gravitated in the same kind of conversational circles or critical circles. And, and it was natural for me to gravitate in that direction as well. So when I was at university, I read more. I, I, I acted in a piece of Pinter at university and later on. Which play uh, did you act in? I played the Dirty Old Man in, in The Night Out, which is uh, one of his early TV plays. I think it was his first play that was performed on TV in 1960. And so when uh, did you first come across Betrayal and what uh, impression did it make on you? Well, Betrayal I'd never read and I saw a performance of it in uh, 1993, I think it was. And it was a touring performance by, uh, by a company from Lincoln. And one of my friends was in this company. So... I invited them to do their tour at the university I was working at at that time. And they came and performed in our studio there. And it was a remarkable performance. I remember just being emotionally beaten by it, just gobsmacked. And by the end of the play, the audience were just beaten into submission by the power of the play. But I remember very, very distinctly that sense of silence in the audience at the end, where normally the applause would kick in, uh, where people were just kind of waiting to be almost like released from what they'd just been through. I have seen several productions of Betrayal over the years, but my interest in appreciating the play really deepened recently when I, I did a course in directing last year. And as it happened, we chose Betrayal to dissect in forensic detail in order to consider how to approach directing it. And this work included analyzing the play virtually line by line to tap into the subtext of what the characters were saying, 
to identify what the character's particular objectives are at any one moment in each scene for themselves in relation to each other. And this was a fantastically rich experience. I mean, I came away with an even greater appreciation for the depth of potential meaning in Pinter's language and in the dynamics of the relationships. And however simple the dialogue appeared, everything that is said was loaded with meaning and opened a nuance and interpretation. I mean, I had known Pinter, obviously, and um, seen this work before and many others, but working on it in that sort of detail gives me an even greater understanding and appreciation of what he's done and possibly about why it also still endures, but we'll come to that. Before we dive into the detail of the play, I think for listeners that are not as familiar with the play as you are, could you just give us a very brief summary of the setup, the scenario of what the play is actually about? It's a good question. What is it about? <laughs> that, it's not, not a question. Well, you can who, who, okay, let's start with the characters and what the scenario between them is. <laughs> what happened? Very summary level, yeah. Yeah. It's a play that involves uh, or that, that focuses on a relationship between Jerry and his best friend's wife, Emma, uh, his best friend being, uh, being Robert. But the relationship between the two men clearly is an important one. And that somehow the decay in their relationship is being charted through the play. But it, the play looks at the history of that relationship. It starts at the end of the relationship or after the end of the relationship. And the play finishes with the scene where the seduction for, is first attempted. Jerry attempts to sedu seduce his best friend's wife at a party in 1968. So that's the end of the play. So there's a reverse chronology, as you've already mentioned to it, which, which has a certain impact on how you absorb that. But that's really it, really. That's all they do. And there's, there's these meetings between these different configurations of these three characters, uh, which goes back to the central. There's nine scenes, and the central scene is, takes place in Venice, where uh, Robert uh, reveals that he has discovered that his wife is having an affair. But this affair goes on for uh, nine years, and Robert discovers halfway through, but doesn't tell his friend that he has discovered that he's having an affair with his wife. And the play begins with that revelation, with Robert discovering that his friend always knew, or not always knew, but knew for, for a number of years. I mean, I think uh, one of the things that happens with the reverse chronology, as we'll talk about, is that it's very much figuring out who knows what at what stage and how that yeah. influences how they behave. So Jerry, as you said, is Robert's best friend, was his best man at their wedding. They are also professionally acquainted. Robert is a publisher and Jerry is a literary agent. So That's they right. know each other pretty well in that sphere as well. Jerry is also married, by the way. He's married to a character called Judith. And both of these couples have families, have children. We don't see any of these other characters. We don't see Jerry's wife, Judith, and as, as the text is written, and we don't see any of the children. We do hear about them by, in references made by the three main characters, as you say. Now, one of the things I think that's pretty well known is that the scenario of the affair that is the core of the play between Jerry and Emma was based on events in Pinter's own life. Can you tell us something about that, Mark? Yeah, the, the structure of the affair in the play very much matches the um, seven-year-long affair that Harold Pinter had in the 1960s with Joan Bakewell. He was married to Vivian Merchant and had a, a child with her. And Joan Bakewell obviously was married to Michael Bakewell and had a couple of kids I think three, I, don't, I can't remember. They met at a party, or well, they'd met a couple of times, but it, at a party they, they had this coming together, which started their affair. They got a, a flat that they could meet in, in London, just as the characters do in the play. Michael Bakel wasn't a friend of Harold Pinter's, but they did work professionally. But Michael Bakel was very instrumental in, in getting some of Harold's work on, on the TV, on the radio. And so that, you know, there, there's an obvious parallels. He's yeah. borrowing from something that happened to him. Joan Bakewell, I think, That's, said, didn't she, at some point, has said that, I think she was quite upset at that, you know, their lives were literally put on the stage here. And although people may have known about it in some circles, uh, you know, obviously to be as explicit as that uh, must have been upsetting. Well, in her autobiography, she talks about how upset she was when she received the script from him. And just the word betrayal was itself very, very painful. This notion that she was being accused of having betrayed her husband or, or what have you. So I think she took it quite understandably, of course, very literally, that this is about them. Whereas I think in Harold Pinter's mind, is well, I've borrowed the structure, but what the play is saying and doing isn't about us, I think, was his attitude. But Interesting, because he, uh, he wrote the play about 10 years after? The affair ended. So it wasn't um, like in the immediate aftermath. And no. by then he'd already started an affair with Antonia Fraser, mm -hmm. whom he subsequently married, of course. He divorced Vivian Merchant, as you said, uh, finally, and, and married Antonia Fraser. 
And actually, I read somewhere, I don't know how true this is, it may be apocryphal, but that uh, while he was having the affair with Joan Baker, well, he was having an affair with someone else as well. I don't know whether that's true or not, but one way or another, it seemed to be that he had some experience of betrayal. By the of time marital, marital betrayal, yeah, absolutely. If I remember I was at a conference sitting next to Antonio Prater after he had died, and, and somebody on, was t- giving a paper about him and said he was a ladies' man. And I, I turned to Antonio and said, that's a bit cheeky with you sitting, sitting here in the audience, a bit cheeky for them. And she said to me, no, no, it's true. <laughs> so, uh, so it could have been about any of these scenarios, although it did very much match the triangle, his affair with Joan Bakewell. I mean, I, I also read that Michael Bakewell, Joan's husband, had discovered the affair, but then hadn't revealed to Pinter that he had. And apparently Pinter was indignant about this in some form, in the way that the men in the play here also somehow betraying each other by not it, being honest. It was a letter that, that Harold Pinter sent to Joan Bakewell in Venice when they were on holiday. And that telegram, that telegram now exists. You can go and read it in the British yeah. Library. She has deposited her letters from Harold Pinter in the British Library, I think, last year. So I've gone and read that letter. Which remo- There's a remarkable series of letters where he talks about writing a new play, which is fascinating. So, yeah, it, the, the mapping of the play on real life is very, very close. And, of course, Pinter did get on the phone. And so when he found out that, that Michael had known for a while, he got on the phone and said, you've got to come and talk to me about this. How dare you? You know, <laughs> and I, I, I don't think that Pinter could have written this play and included those details, especially that detail of, of him being angry with Michael Bakewell, as it were, or, or, or Jerry being angry with Robert for not telling him that he knew. I don't think he could written that, have written that without a sense of self-awareness. You know, this, this tells us, I think, something about what he's doing with the play. I'm not saying the play is confessional, but I think there's a, there's a moment of understanding, it seems to me, in the writing of that scene. Anyway, we can talk about that. Yes, we'll come to that scene, which is, and there are a number of, all of the scenes are crucial, but that one in particular, in the middle of the play, as you make, where it's in Venice and he discovers the affair, is particularly critical. And I think, as we've, as you've alluded to, his experience will also inform how he treats the relationship between the men, I mean, which is as important, yeah. if not more important, than, than mm-hmm. with Emma. I mean, it also seems to know, rather than just his personal life, where the play fits into his professional career as a playwright. Because it, he, by the time he wrote Betrayal in, in 1977, 78, he had been writing for at least 20 years, hadn't he? What was, or just thereabouts. So where does this fit into his oeuvre? Well, uh, in 1957, his friend, uh, his hackney friend, Henry Wolfe, wrote to him and said, can you write me a play? I, I, he, Henry had gone to Bristol to do an MA in drama, and was the first one in the country. And he wrote back to Harold and said, can you write me a play? And Harold wrote back and said, I can't possibly write you a play uh, in the amount of time that you're telling me, just you know, less than a week. Um, and three days later, The Room arrived and uh, Henry put on the performance of that first play. So that was 1957, his first play. He tried to get on in London. He, the birthday party was his next play, but it was a famously a bit of a flop in London. It was rejected by the critics, most of the critics, and, and, and ran only four or five days. But then The, the Caretaker in 1960 is, the, is where his fortunes turned, and, and it ran for so long. It, it just ran nearly for a whole year. It was really successful, and it set him up. There was a period in the early 60s where he was doing lots of television dramas that were very successful. And then The Homecoming is another very famous play, which really consolidated his reputation in 1965 uh, at the Royal uh, Shakespeare Company. And he had a relationship in the 60s with the Royal Shakespeare Company. That transferred with Peter Hall to her relationship with the National Theatre. So Peter Hall directed a number of his important plays, including The Homecoming in 1964-65, and then uh, Old Times in 1969-70. Uh, and then when Peter Hall went on to run the National, he took Pinter with him effectively. And then we get to plays like No Man's Land, yeah. 1975, and then Betrayal, 1978, which is uh, the, the final play, the last play directed by Peter Hall. Now, it's interesting that when you look at that first, what I'm going to say, first phase of his career up until Betrayal, in a sense, there's certain, I mean, you could possibly be argued that you could group these plays into a certain style. There was a, a critic who labeled the, the early play, The Birthday Party even, I think, but it could be applied to a number of others as a comedy of menace. And I think by that, there was an apparently, you know, innocent situation that somehow becomes threatening and absurd as they behave in some ways that seem a bit inexplicable and you're not really sure who's who and what the relationships are. But then betrayal is not really that, is it? It's very much different than this comedy of menace. I mean, there is menace 
and there is comedy, I suppose, but it's much more conventional and recognizable world to the audiences. You know, adultery of the literary classes is not exactly experimental subject. So how does this come? What is this, what is this transition that's happening in his work? It's a remarkable change in a way. I mean, his, his last main play before this was No Man's Land, which is very bleak and, and difficult and it's funny as well, of course. But it involves those strangers entering in through doors and people finding themselves in awkward, menacing situations. But here, betrayal comes kind of out of nowhere. It's not at all Pinteresque. It's very clear who everybody is. There's no ambiguity. They tell us straight away who they are and what's happened between them. So it's a very different play. It wasn't very well received in many ways. People felt that Pinter was going off in 1978 when this was performed. It's a sense of him. It's just a, a middle class drama, you know, between people having an affair. Who cares? It was the kind of critical response that for a while. So this is this is a question and a label which we'll we'll come back to to uh, I think at some point once we talk through this whole thing because uh, of course I don't think we'd be here if we actually believed that that was all this play was and why is it not just that the other thing that interests me was that the times that he was living through that this this play is set now we can talk about how much this is a play just about the time in 1977 or 78 and I don't think it is I think there's much more universality to that but what is interesting is think about you know the world in which he was living and had, and these characters would have been living when he wrote it and how that informed it I mean when we were looking at the play in the directing course I mentioned we did some background work on what was happening in the, in the society at the time. Is that something that you've thought about that you would have said did inform what he was doing at this point? There's a kind of a yes and a no answer, answer here, I, I, I guess. I mean, in many ways, one of the things that was criticisms that was leveled at him was, was that he was completely out of sync with the zeitgeist. The State of the Nation plays, that the Howard Brenton, David Hares and the, you know, the big long epics that were going on in the National and, and elsewhere in London at the time, where people are addressing what was going on in the world and here he is having three people drinking you know drinking wine and, and talking about an affair and you know so so from one point of view he seemed to be completely out of it he, here he was he was well established he was now wealthy he could throw a play at the national theater and they would put it on that was the kind of response that there's no kind of social reflection here however i think in terms of that what he's processing in terms of maybe if you took a gendered look at the play and the way in which um, the men treat the woman and the way in which women in society are being presented here in a kind of a post-60s world where women are now professional. It feels very dated to think in these terms now, of course. We're way beyond that. I mean, we're a long way from equality, of course, still. But back at this time, there's still that, you know, the, the play opens with a man having a beer and a woman having a glass of wine. So the gendering is very clearly written into the play. The woman looking after the children, for example. There's talk of childcare in the second scene, but it seems like an inconvenience rather than something that the men do naturally. And and all this, this ridiculous chat that the men have about male babies and, uh, what is it, male babies and female babies, what's the difference between them? Must be something to do with their genders, I think they say. Uh, I think there's some of that in the background. Uh, and I think Pinter seems to be processing something very important about the treatment of people, whether it is, you know, from a gendered perspective, or whether it's to do with respect as opposed to betrayal or integrity as opposed to betrayal. Sure, I think um, that's absolutely I right. And I, I don't think it was clearly not, as you say, a social play, a political play in that sense. But it would have been recognized, I think, as such, in a, in a sense, for personal reasons for people. Because these issues are still what actually, not just influenced, but what we're consumed about today in terms of gender relationships and roles in society and, and our own individual lives. I mean, Joan Bakewell talked about how she was living at the time and how, you know, you, you rightly pointed out the transition from the 1960s through the the 70s and so on, these were pretty cat cataclysmic times. Big social change was going on in terms mm -hmm. of women's rights in, in the workplace and or freedoms to be able to pursue a career, freedoms uh, sexually, obviously. So, so there would have established a sort of sense that you know, there were different kinds of expectations and freedoms and possibilities for women and men and what that meant mm -hmm. to men and women living in that time. And Joan Bakewell refers to exactly this arc of her own life and how she was actually juggling a career, her marriage, her children, and an affair in the way that these characters do. And actually, people would now as well. Though, as you rightly point out, there are a number of ways where the attitudes that are reflected in this, of course, are anachronistic now. They, the men, it's quite a macho world. The men are inhabiting. They have this assumption of privilege and dominance, certainly. Whether they have any sense that this is under threat, possibly, but 
they certainly haven't assumed dominance. No, I, I think you're absolutely right. I think one thing that the play might be, you, you could consider the players doing, is seeing how the, the old paradigms of, of marriage are now breaking apart and people just don't know where they are with it. Everybody seems to be having an affair with everybody else and nothing is settling and nobody's content. You know, nobody finds whatever it is they're looking for in, in that. So it's very, a very sad play from that point of view. Yeah, so the brave new world of of, um, open, of promiscuity isn't necessarily all it's cracked up to be. Is one also, of the things that I think comes out of it, of course. But also with that thing about you, you talk about the the macho world. I think one thing that Pinto was very good at doing in the '60s, you know, way before anyone else was presenting interaction between men in this way, is, is examining what we would call today toxic masculinity. And I think he, you know, if you even you look at something like his screenplay for the, from the servant or, or the caretaker, more famously before that. You're looking at the, the inability of men to manage their interactions properly. And I think that that's a theme that runs through a lot of his work. And I think, in a way, betrayal is a pinnacle of his examination of that, that men's inability to love one another properly. And I'm talking men to men, that need that men have for one another as Pinter perceived it, and their inability to structure that in a way that was fulfilling. You're absolutely right. There was a moment when we were first reading the play again, looking at it for directing, where there's a line from Robert very casually saying that it's true that he's hit his wife once or twice. It wasn't to defend a principle. I wasn't inspired to do it from any kind of moral standpoint. I just felt like giving her a good bashing. The old itch, you understand. This just jumped out of us, shocking in this day and age, of course. Uh, But presenting that as just standard at the time, but clearly dysfunctional as well. Yeah, nobody, I mean, people would have been shocked then, of course. I mean, but I think that the important function of that is for us, he's, we're not on his side. We as audience do not like this man because he's just admitted to wife bashing and we've met her. She's nice. So that's the function of it theatrically, isn't it? But then that fires back on us later when we start feeling sorry for him. It's, it's beautifully constructed from that point of view. And I don't condone that kind of violence. I'm not suggesting that. What I'm suggesting is that Pinto's structured that in there to make it difficult for us to like Robert. Yes. Only then to make us later feel a little bit, oh, hang on, this is difficult now. I didn't like this guy, but I see his pain. I think w- one of the things that strikes me about it is, are any of them actually very likable? You yeah. know, they're not, it's not the most graceful behaviors and they tend to be first selfish above all else, really. They want everything they desire in whatever aspect of their lives. And it doesn't seem to occur to them what costs there may be in that or what other obligations they may have. But one of the things also that's so interesting about the play, and we touched on at the beginning, is what you as the audience know or don't know, and the way that this reverse chronology is so sensitively managed. In the published text, each scene, there are nine scenes, as you said, the year, the season, and the location of each scene is given as a stage direction, if you're reading the play. But if you're in the audience, This is not necessarily explicit. I don't know whether you've seen productions where they actually tell the audience somehow or it's in the program or something or not, and whether that makes a difference. What do you think? My view is that I think they have to be shown. They're written as as an integral part of the performance, as a part of the play, and I think the intention is for them to be seen. So um, certainly I have seen productions where they've done that. So in the most recent, Jamie Lloyd, for example, they had uh, light projections on the back screen. I saw a production in Israel where they had almost like these comic interludes with people walking on with placards. I've seen people come, just basically come forward and change, a, not, not quite a whiteboard, but some kind of configuration like that, where you would have that. But of course, and I've also seen the performances where there's no mention of that at all. And of course, if, if you watch the play, then you do follow, it, you know, you, you get it. Uh, you might be th- thrown a little bit that it's going backwards in time. But once it happens and it's established, you kind of, accept that as its structure. It's an interesting point. I mean, I think there must be pluses and minuses to either way of doing this, but I actually was more drawn to the idea of not knowing because I think one of the things that's amazing about it is how that makes you, as an audience, engage so specifically in deciphering what is going on. I mean, when are we? What is the dynamic of the relationships that are happening? What has happened in the interim? That's really what the play is partly all about. So you end up so sensitive to those things because you are forced in the nicest possible way to figure it out as it's happening. What else do you think, though, that this reverse chronology, I mean, what else do you think it does to how we react to the play or what the play is? 
Well, I always address this question by saying, well, why did he do it? Why, why do we think he, do, you know, he's not the kind of person that does things stylistically for the sake of it, or just, just as, as, a, as, as a gimmick or anything. And so in order to do that, you do a thought experiment. Well, what would happen if you played the scenes in the order chronologically that they happened? Well, it just wouldn't work, would it? But what you would start doing is seeing cause and effect in a way that the reverse chronology does not allow you to see. You start to f engage and invest in characters and care for them what's going to happen to them just as you do with any other regular drama he doesn't want you to do that so clearly he doesn't want you to invest in the characters in terms of their emotional damage in the usual way because then we get lost in their story and that that's a distraction from whatever else it is he wants to do so that that's how i think of this he clearly wants to tell this story without us getting and i don't mean in terms of in a kind of brechtian alienation way but I mean, he clearly doesn't want us to get that series of that uh, linear investment in character that we would usually have. Our investment in character is one of trying to understand what's happened to them and caring through that instead. So taking away cause and effect also means we don't make judgments. If it was a play about intermarriage, well, we, of course we still do, but we're not being led into making judgments in the same way. If, if we see the cause and effect in the same way, then in a sense, we're being led to disapprove in a very traditional way of these characters' behaviours. But of course, as in the, the, the scene in Venice when they're talking about, is it Casey or Spinks now? <laughs> they're talking about the novel, I think it's Spinks, isn't it? The novel that, that she's reading in the Venice room. What's, the, what's it about? Betrayal? No, it isn't. You know, a very, yes. very deliberate reference to the, the, the title of the play. I think I might understand that somehow, even though it, you're saying he's somehow creating a distance with this technique, it is still emotionally enormously powerful. And I Absolutely. think you are invested in caring about how these characters, what they've done to themselves in their lives and how they've hurt each other and others. And I don't disagree. I think that's very important and that has to happen. What I'm saying is imagine the kind of investment you would have in those things if it was the other way. And that's a very different experience, I think. Well, I think one of the things that also does it struck me is that it's a bit like we know more than they do at various times, yeah. right? So if you're in that position, you see, and you see their lives over time, it somehow enhances the, our, our sense of their humanity, their frailty, their flaws, because they don't know what will happen to them as they live their lives and make the decisions that they do. And we're somehow observing that. And and actually, we're doing that all the time. We don't know what we're doing when we're making these decisions. So yeah. there's something in that perspective, I think, that gives it added poignancy as well. There's also, I would say, from the director's perspective and then the actors, an enormous richness in the playing of these scenes where the question is, what do they know when and how are they playing that? So that there's so much there for, I think, for an actors and the directors of the, of the piece to actually unpick and to, and to use. Yeah. There's a wonderful ambiguity going on as well. And it's sort of just happening because of this device. And it, I guess, as you said before, that maybe it becomes more about how people do behave towards each other and, and, and assessing and, and just are spending time there and recognizing not just about what they're actually doing, but how they're going about doing this, that, they're, that, that their language, for example, of deception, we're sort of more attuned to their language of deception and how they're hiding things, saying things that they mean but don't mean. And we're more attuned to that than we are to the actual plot dynamic at that point as a result because we know why they're there or what the outcome will be but what we don't know is how they went around about it i hope the listeners will appreciate this because we talk like we know the play inside out but i wondered whether we might just talk about a few of the scenes at least and how it unfolds and how he achieves these results as well so as we said at the, at the top the play opens in the pub and it's two years since the end of the affair and we discover that they had a flat together like you said they did in real life that Emma may have been having, maybe having another affair with a writer named Casey, and in fact then reveals that she and Robert are probably going to separate. She's just the night before discovered that Robert's had multiple affairs, so she thinks her marriage is over. And so, okay, so all that may be fact of the opening scene, but more interesting to me is I wonder what you think they're both there for. What do they feel at this stage? What do they each feel about the affair they had now that they're some time past it? Why does Emma call Jerry at this point? Why does she want to see him? What do they want from this meeting? Yeah, it's, you know, it's the question I always put to my students when we talk about this play is, why has she called him? Why are they here together? Now, of course, it, when we're starting to watch the play, that, that question isn't immediately apparent. What's immediately apparent, these two people who haven't seen each other for a while are having drinks. 
we don't know anything yet about the, the separation or we learn about the affair pretty soon. They seem quite chatty, they seem quite happy, but there's this, there is this underlying tension, there is this underlying emotion. It's almost like they, they know they're playing a game. This, this is how we talk in this circumstance. He breaks it with the word darling and she says, no, no, stop. Just, just that moment where he says darling yes. seems to suggest that everything else has been a construct that they know that they are maintaining. It also betrays potentially that, I mean, you're right, there is an edge to this. And the question is, who's happy or not happy about where they are in the world now and what happened yeah. to them? How, who was responsible for ending this affair? Does Jerry feel a bitterness about it because he thinks Emma did cut it off and he would rather it continue? When he says darling, you think, wait a second, does he want her back? Is that what he's yeah. saying? He still regrets this? And why has she called him? She's called him, as you said, the morning after she thinks her marriage is over and her husband has been un multiply unfaithful. And she's re thinking back and she talks through the scene quite fondly, nostalgically about their time together. Mm. So he's, is she thinking, do I go back to this? But of course, actually, she doesn't really want to do that. We discover she's, she's very busy. He said she's running a successful art gallery. And that was one of the reasons potentially that they couldn't meet more often. So she yeah. isn't really saying that, I think. And in fact, at the end of the scene, she basically says, no, it's too late. Everything's gone. Everything's finished. Yeah. Although that could be something that she's realized during the scene, of course. But, but I think you're right. I, I, I think she's gone back to a point of, com of comfort, somebody who knows her well. And maybe that's just all it is. She doesn't have to know what it is she's doing. You know, we, we do in real life, make, do these things without really knowing what our motivations are. But he has this, this other moment, doesn't he, where he says, I don't need to think of you. Yes. He repeats, he repeats it. I don't need to think of you. As if, something there is, as if there is something corporeal between them that will never go away. It's a remarkable moment. It's almost like a, a little gap has opened up and you see the depth of emotion underneath before yes. it's sealed up again. Yes, and I think there's a real tap into the depth of feeling they had and the regret he has. that he And she hasn't left him. She is still inside him. And it's not like I have to consciously think. You're just there and still there. So that's pretty yeah. profound. So the next scene is the same, later the same day after Jerry has met Emma and discovered that Robert now knows about their affair. And he wants to confront Robert about this because he didn't know that Robert knew. And that also that will change, change their relationship now that Robert knows that his best friend's been having, having an affair with his wife. So he's very upset about this. He's, he's concerned and worried about where this leaves him. So he asked Robert to come around to his house. But this scene is much more about the relationship between the men than it is about the affair, isn't it? What is going on in this scene with, that Jerry is, gets so upset with Robert about as well? It's, it's an important scene in many ways. I mean, in many ways, it's just a transitional scene, but it's setting everything up. Oh, we've, we've got some of the jigsaw. This is the rest of it before we can then go backwards in time. And, and what's important, of course, is that Jerry is absolutely devastated and angry with Robert for having known about the affair and not having told him, as if somehow Robert has broken a code between men. He, you know, Jerry, who had an affair with Robert's wife, calls Robert a bastard. Yeah. <laughs> And of course, Robert quite rightly says, oh, don't you call me a bastard. But that's an important moment, isn't it? That what, what, what is being deposited by Pinter early on is that the betrayal is between Robert and Jerry. That's the bigger betrayal here. Not yes. the fact that he was sleeping with his wife, because already we've learned that Robert was doing that as well. He's not, he's not an innocent party here. Yes. Pinter has made that clear. He set the ground for that. But what's important now, as you, as you say, is it's about the, the, the relationship between the two men and, and the fact that somehow they've broken a code. They're obviously falling apart. They haven't been seeing each other anyway. And, and of course, things like squash, this repeated reference to playing squash, acts as that kind of a signifier of them failing to meet up and failing. They don't play squash. There's all this talk of playing squash. There's no evidence that they've ever played squash together in the whole play. No, but, but a, this, it's, a, it's a sort of <laughs> macho metaphor, isn't it? That, that yeah. of, of doing battle uh, always. And Robert's always the one provoking Jerry, mm. saying, come on, come to the battlefield, so to speak. We need to, yeah. we need to test each other in, this, in, the, in the squash court. And it's also um, intimate and communal, isn't it? There's an intimacy it about playing squash and being sweaty and having the shower together, which they talk about later. We'll, yeah, we'll so it's a very, a very male bonding exercise. So then, as you say, it's set up there. And then we, we do jump back in time to scene three, which takes place in the, uh, Emma and Jerry's flat, the lover's flat. We work out that it's two years pre previous to the first two scenes. And it's actually what we call the end of the affair. They are meeting in the flat for the last time. They haven't been meeting in the flat together and they call it a day. But again, it's interesting when just to follow the dynamics at that point as to what either of them want 
Are they deliberately choosing to end this affair? Are they happy to do so? Whose call is it? What is going on there? They're failing to communicate, aren't they? They're, they're, they're not, they've got to a point of, of just not knowing what to do. And of course, we learn at the end of the scene, so that Jerry argues that there's no point having the flat because they can't meet in it anymore. And at the end of the scene, she points out, well, I'm here now. On Thursday afternoons, I always have an afternoon off. So yes. we could do it. So we could meet still. So the, the, the notion that they're not meeting, it's not clear who has failed, but Jerry is blaming her. She, and, and she is saying, it's, you know, it's not me. So so it's a, it's, yeah, she, I mean, it sounds like they give, they give all sorts of practical excuses. But as yeah. you say, Emma revealing that time is not the one. It's obviously a will. The will is not there anymore. And it's a very sad scene because it's, they're going to talk about emptying the flat, handing the keys back, and it's all over. So it's a, it's a pretty sad ending to the affair. The next scene is, again, going further back in time, only a few months, I think, before, not long before the affair ends. Jerry and Robert initially, they're at Robert and Emma's house, and Jerry and Robert initially talking. Again, a very unsettling atmosphere because you're not sure what the purpose is of this scene, what Robert's or Jerry's intent here is. Do you realize that Robert knows about the affair at this point? Because we've learned it as an audience but that Jerry doesn't. It's a very unsettling atmosphere. And then it's also even a, a triangularly uncertain because it seems like Emma doesn't really know what Jerry's doing. He's going to New York next week. She didn't know that. And at the end, Emma ends up crying on Robert's shoulder. And you think, what is their relationship? What is happening at that point? It's an incredible scene. You're right. It finishes with Robert comforting his wife about her sadness about a relationship she's having with another man. So yes. there's, there's a kind of loving domesticity around it. But, but you know, it starts with her upstairs putting the kids to bed before she comes down. And the, the two men have this rather awkward, strange com- conversation about the difference between the sexes and why boy babies cry more than girl babies. Uh, but you're right, yeah. We, we found out that Robert knows, Jerry didn't know that Robert knows. And here's the only scene in the play in which that dynamic is put to play. Uh, Jerry is there, ignorant of his friend's knowledge of his affair. And so there's a kind of, I, it'd be great to play as an actor because you're, Jerry is, is projecting to Emma, thinking he's bypassing Robert. Robert can see that projection and can play with it. Emma is, is aware of that muteness. She can't speak to Jerry about that. And then, of course, as you say, she discovers something about him going away that she didn't know. And she can't emotionally respond to it, except when he leaves with her husband. So it's a beautifully crafted scene from that point of view, that all these unspoken are crafted into this otherwise mundane dialogue. Yes, and um, Emma, I mean, there's a sense that Emma, there's a recognition on Emma's part that this affair may is, may not have a future now somehow, yeah. and she's, she is, of course, still in her marriage and close to, to what they share. She and Robert share the secret for a start, as well as a whole life, mm-hmm. and he's there emotionally for her at that point. We talked at the very beginning about the next scene, the central scene of the play, fifth scene of nine in Venice. There are three scenes actually at the center of the play, I think, that are all equally explosive and they are just electrifying, I think. So in Venice, Emma and Robert are on holiday in one of the most romantic places in the world, of course. They have planned to go on a visit to Torcello, one of the, the most romantic places in the world as well, where they had been first 10 years earlier when they were just after they were married. However, Robert has discovered that she is having an affair with Jerry because he picks up a letter from Jerry at the local Amex office. But the thing that's so amazing about this scene is the way that Robert just circles her and baits her and because he now knows this, but he's going to get her to tell him. And he just surgically cuts her to pieces until the point she has no option but to confess. Fantastic scene the way Robert, and Robert, of course, is just a volcano waiting to explode, just holding in anger and bitterness and very caustic and cutting, but in a just about controlled way. I think that that's absolutely right. I mean, the emotion inside and yet the surface is seemingly calm and controlled. Incidentally, this is a play that doesn't get, it's, it's one of its most important plays, but it doesn't get a lot of performances outside the UK. It's not part of the world canon necessarily in all mm. around the world in the same way that the birthday party or the caretaker is. One of the, one of the arguments of this is it's so very British. This British buttoned upness, this failure to say what you're really feeling, failure to express your real emotions, and everything is closeted in very carefully constructed language. And this is a perfect example of that, Robert having this, this awful emotion of having discovered that his wife's having an affair with his best friend. And yes, he's teasing her. There's a kind of cat and mouse. There's a kind of callousness about it. So I'm not going to come and confront you. 
I'm going to lead you to understand that I know, and you're going to have to confess. One of the interesting parts that you say that is that they don't, he doesn't do this directly. They talk, he talks about literature. Literature is often one of the, one of the battlegrounds as well, used, I guess, in some form to identify whose allegiances are with whom. So you said, yeah. mentioned earlier, Emma happens to be reading one of the, a novel by another one of these new authors that Jerry has discovered. So Sorry, which Robert, Robert has refused to publish. Yeah. Yes, is rejected. Which so they, is so again, they, they, you know, Jerry and Emma are together on this literary opinion, and Robert's outside that. All, and but somehow one's feelings about literature become symbolic of what their emotional attachments are. And he's just playing with that. He's just using that as a way again to try and express what's really going on. And, and, and of course, the literature is the bond between the men as well, and not just in terms of their current profession but it's what brought them together at Oxford and Cambridge, isn't it? This love of poetry, which of course is another betrayal going on in the background. They betray their literary ideals through commerce. Exactly. So they have this debate about the fact that they once were idealistic poetry editors and are now publishing patent mm. that makes money. So they betrayed themselves somehow as well. Yeah. So then the scene, next scene immediately follows Venice. So everybody's come back from Venice and Jerry and Emma meet in their lover's flat. Emma's just come back from Venice and now um, knows that Robert knows about their affair. Jerry doesn't know this yet. So does Emma tell Jerry that Robert knows? What is her plan? Her husband has discovered her affair. What is she going to do with her lover now? It's fantastic setup. And the way they dance around what each wants from each other at that point. Jerry, of course, his, his lover has just come back, having been on a romantic holiday in some form or other, he thinks, with her husband. And he probably thinks, I'd like to reclaim her. I want to make sure she hasn't had too good a time with her husband in Venice. So he's probing as to what, how was Venice. She is exploring what is the future of their relationship potentially. And there's some amazing things going, hints going on there where she, she's bought a tablecloth in Venice. And she said she bought it for the house, but which house? She brings it to the flat and she displays it for the table in the flat. And she talks about creating a home in this flat. And Jerry, of course, says this has never been a home. It's just been a flat to make love in, not a home. Does she want it to be a home? Is she suggesting, is there a possibility I can leave my husband for you? But she doesn't come out and say this. She doesn't even come out and say that Robert knows about this. We have to do something about our lives. She just again, rather obtusely, approaches this and says, at one stage, do you think, for example, we'll ever go to Venice together? Long pause from Jerry. He doesn't immediately say, yes, dear, we'll definitely do that someday. Or yes, I'd love to do that. I'm going to leave my wife. Let's go away together. His non-answer is the answer. She realizes this and says, no, we probably won't. And from then on, I think she's decided I'm not going any further with this. And she, does, she decides, as we know, not to tell Jerry that Robert knows and continue the affair with that knowledge and without telling Jerry. Further betrayal, of course, to Jerry himself. That's right. And, and it's, a, it's the scene where she shows her biggest flaw, isn't it? The, most of the play, she's the most sympathetic character or the least unsympathetic character. Whereas here, she's got an opportunity now to come clean, as it were, with Jerry. Like my husband knows now. We have to base what we do now on that knowledge. You know, do we stay together? Do we split up? But she doesn't do that. Obviously, what she's doing is trying to make a decision. Do I live with Jerry now? Do I leave my husband? Is he prepared to make that commitment? He's happy with the domestic arrangement that she's yes. setting before him. Yes. But she's, she's creating that domestic arrangement, perhaps, because she wants it to be the default one. And of course, I think it's, an, it's, it's, I don't think she clearly knows. It's an ambiguity, isn't it, all the yeah. way through of conducting an affair like this. How can you love two people, maintain two households? She cannot ultimately square that circle, and she doesn't even realize that she can't square that circle. It's a tense, fascinating scene, again, based on what we know that Jerry in particular doesn't. Then the, the third, I think, explosive scene is when Robert and Jerry have lunch in Italian, of course, restaurant. Uh, with a mural of Venice, of all things, on the wall. And this is the first time after they've returned from Venice that Jerry uh, sees Robert, and that Robert sees Jerry. And Robert, of course, knows now that Jerry has had an affair with his wife for five years. Jerry's arranged to have lunch with him, and Robert is there when, when Jerry arrives. He's been drinking before he arrives. And you think, God, this could get pretty explosive. This um, is going to be the confrontation, isn't it? That's correct. what you expect. What's interesting is that Robert makes a decision in this scene, and you, you can almost find the point at which he makes that decision. No, I'm not going to accuse him. I'm going to stay his friend because that's more important. 
the sacrifice that he makes, or rather the token that he makes of this, is Casey. Casey is being used, therefore, as a bond between the two men. Again, it's literature that brings them together. This friendship is still important. You know, it's that kind of token that he throws in. But yeah, there's so much drink that's, that's downed here. And so he gets more and more drunk. And clearly, it, it seems to me that he's prepared to make that confrontation and slowly d- moves away from it to the point of making that kind of tokenistic response. And then they end up talking about literature again. They get back into their bond. The result in the end is Robert settles for, you know, continuing, as you say. He says, for example, I am I mean, there's nothing really wrong with his marriage. I've got the family. Emma and I are very good together. He sort of knows he has the cards in some respect and that Emma isn't going to leave him. But to get to that, he has to get to that as well, because it, in the early part of the scene or through it, you, you know, especially fueled by the drink, there is an anger under there and a bitterness, which you just think is going to explode at any moment. Mm. Someone described the scene as a metaphoric boxing match, if you think about it like that, if they are sparring these two men. So it is, it is confrontational in a British way, but that you're right, Robert ultimately decides, I'm going to keep it as it is. And in doing so, he's sacrificing his wife. His wife is the currency that he's prepared to spend to keep his friend. So that's another betrayal. He betrays his wife, in a sense, by not just, let's have it straight. You know, you've been seeing my wife. That's not done. Yes. Instead, no, actually, I'm, go- I'm going to subsume that because whatever it is between the men is more important. I hadn't, I hadn't realized what you, you know, when you were saying earlier about this being more popular in Britain than around the world. And if you started to think about an American version of this play, it just, it just wouldn't be, would it? It would just all come out straight away. But I think betrayal is one of those that doesn't export particularly well for this very reason, that when you read it on the surface, not a lot is being said emotionally. They should be upset, shouldn't they? But they don't seem to be upset. And, you know, that seems to be the reading that I, I get told internationally is, is the response to betrayal. See that? I, I think ironically, I think that's what the great strength of the play is, of course. I think that the, oh, yeah. the, the, the subtext and the language and the ambiguity of it in these highly charged moments and relationships is what gives it its power. It's far, far more powerful to do that than just shout. The second to last scene goes back in time again, two years prior to the previous three scenes where it's all come to a head in the center of the play. And you see in the flat, Emma and Jerry essentially at their happiest. They're in the early stages of their affair. And as we said earlier, Emma is making this flat into a bit of a home. She's literally got an apron on in his cooking stew for lunch. She talks about changing his life potentially. She refers to Jerry's wife and talks about faithfulness and about the house there. And I think there's some part of her that's saying, could we have a life together, even back at that point? But again, he doesn't rise to that. She backs off, I think. Mm. And finally, actually, she also then reveals that she's pregnant. This is, is the child that Ned, who is born during the affair, but actually she tells Jerry that it's her husband's child as well. So again, she's al- aligning herself to stay with her existing family. And Jerry, likewise, is aligning himself to stay with his existing family. I mean, you talked in your book, uh, in the chapter about betrayal, about children and families and the part they play in this play. What do you think the characters' attitudes are to their families? How they think about them in relation to their behavior? It's interesting, isn't it? Because, you know, if they had no children, there would be a very, very different kind of response from us, wouldn't they? In a sense, we kind of think of children as a collateral damage, don't we, in, in relationship breakups. And so there's a kind of level of moral responsibility not to hurt the children. But I think the first mention of children in the first scene is very loving. There's a, there's a sense of how cherished these children are. And of course, we have this motif of Jerry remembering throwing up um, Robert and Emma's daughter. In Charlotte, the air. yes. Yeah, Charlotte. He remembers throwing Charlotte up in, in her kitchen, but it was his kitchen. And, and I, I latch on to this, this false memory that he's constructed of something going on where he is part of their family in their kitchen, when really it was just a party at his house. And there seems to be something very important there. I I talk in my book about the impossible family being a a strand throughout 1970s and early 1980s and even into the 90s, Harold Pinter, this sense of this desperate need to build a family and this being a kind of fantasy that forces people into this kind of false or or this behaviour without integrity to themselves. Because it simply is not going to happen that the two families are going to merge. That, that the two men, in a sense, want to be part of each other's lives, but they fail to give each other anything. And they bring themselves together through Emma. They meet through Emma, in a sense, both physically and emotionally. But she's not there to offer that structure, that apparatus. She wants something of her own. 
But there are various um, times throughout the play where they refer to their children, and Jerry does as well, scene. to his wife and to his son, Sam, and falling off his bike at one stage. He's concerned about that. He's missed that. The problem is, again, that they haven't really, they don't really reconcile the fact that they can't be both, that they can't be one big happy family. They can't even be two happy families and mm -hmm. continue this affair and meet their obligations and be a full and, and successful and happy part of the family. I mean, Jerry obviously laments at various times that he's missing bits when he's not there. And of mm -hmm. course, that's a, one of the mm -hmm. features of an affair is that you're not there at times when you should be. And you may have missed some things that have been going on in your, in your children's lives. It's one of those sacrifices that you make. It's a currency that you spend. And it's just, it's negative, isn't it? Well, uh, interesting. You get to the last scene, which is the spark of the affair, the last scene of the play. It's one that you can sort of imagine on film in, I don't know how many different occasions. A party at Robert and Emma's house. And Jerry is actually taking himself, strangely enough, upstairs and is waiting in Emma's bedroom, Emma and J Robert's bedroom. He is drunk. Jerry is drunk. Emma comes in. He declares his love in actually quite moving, poetic speeches that are uh, and effective enough that Emma falls, I think, for this. I mean, you know, she's initially resistant, of course, but the spark is there and Robert comes in. They somehow get through that. But, you know, it's obvious that this is the beginning, that a line is, has been crossed and that they will betray him. It's a very simple and kind of both light and dark scene because you know now everything that's coming from this moment. Interesting you're saying about those memories earlier about the, of the families. I mean, I, I read in various places that they talk about this as being one of Pinter's memory plays. It's a play about memory and how unreliable perhaps memory is and what it, role it plays in our building our own view of ourselves and our relationships with others and how that can be false as well. Because Throughout, there are times where characters are remembering, remembering things differently from the other character. So as you mentioned, Jerry and Emma remember this event where Jerry throws up Emma's child into the air and catches her, and that it happened in a different location. Jerry, at the very first scene or last scene, remembers that Emma was wearing white at her wedding and that he was in love with her at that. And of course, Emma says, no, I wasn't wearing white. So what are these images that we create, that are stories we create for ourselves about who we are and what our relationships with others are about. Is this what we mean when we say there's a memory play? Personally, I'm not convinced this, is, this fits in that category of memory play. I know that many critics have placed it there, and it, uh, I myself in the past have, have fallen into that. But more recently, I'm, I'm less and less convinced. Certainly, he, he is bringing in those motifs that he has developed in those earlier plays, uh, old times. Most famously, I think, is, is, is the powerful memory play of all. There's another moment uh, of memory where the past and the present is being deliberately mingled in when she talks in the first scene about going back to their flat and looking for the bell, knowing that it's no longer there, but wanting it to be there as though there was an urge for the past to come into the present, just through that evoking that notion of, of seeing the past. As, you know, why would you go up the steps to look at that bell when it clearly is not going to have your name on it anymore? Yes. And yet somehow she's gone through that performance and is talking about that performance as though to bring the past into the present. Yes. So there are a number of those moments where Pinter is mobilizing that device, if you like. And, and I suppose the, the emotion that we live through our lives does abide. So I think there it's an association that you retain somehow and it, it keeps it alive. So the place like Torcello is very important to both of them, I guess, but mainly to Robert. And yeah. he fixes on an, uh, an emotional state of his in his youth, reading Yeats on Torcello, and that somehow defining for him and important, and he keeps that with him. And likewise, the, you know, the affair that they've been through is still in Jerry, she, as we said earlier. None of this has gone away. It is their right, part yeah. of us yeah. and, they, and, and lives with us and, and who we are. We touched on this earlier about how these things are expressed. And I think language in the play is so critical and the way Pinter uses the language. Of course, famously, people talk about Pinter and his pauses. It's not about that. In fact, I think he was at pains often to try and discredit this talk of the pause. He was just saying it's really, it's just a time to take a breath or to, it reflects someone having a thought or maybe a moment of doubt. I don't think we want to overplay that. I think what's more important is that every line has a purpose. There's a subtext based on the character's desires and the struggle between the characters with their conflicting desires that's so potent. And I, I want to just read a piece I, I found about Pinter writing about writing for theater. 
And he said, so often below the word spoken is the thing known and unspoken. My characters tell me so much and no more. Most of the time we are inexpressive, giving little away, unreliable, elusive, evasive, obstructive, unwilling. But it's out of these attributes that a language arises, a language, I repeat, where under what is said, another thing is being said. The whole play is virtually yeah. is that, isn't it? Absolutely. I mean, there is no spare meat on this play. Uh, the economy, I mean, the, you couldn't find a line that you could cut, really. I mean, every line has a function, every line has a purpose. I mean, even that line I was talking about, about remembering going, going to look at the bell, it serves that purpose of bringing back this sense of, is there a yearning there? Is, is there a cataloging of the past going on? And as I was talking earlier, in how everything is surface, how everything is conversationally innocent and seemingly naive. And some of that is passive aggressive. Some of that is just trying to fight, giving somebody a lead to see if they'll go the way you want them to go. For example, with, with, with um, whether it's Emma trying to see if, if there's any purchase from Jerry in terms of staying with her, or, or if it's Robert in a much more callous way trying to get Emma to confess. None of it is direct. None of it is, is them asking, do, do you want to live with me for the rest of your life? Or have you had an affair with my wife? None of that ever happened. It's all surface conversation, polite conversation mostly. It's this language, I think, that raises the play above what we talked about at the very beginning. Is this just a play about adultery among the urban middle classes? And why is it still done or endure? Uh, obviously, these are familiar situations people find themselves in. So there is, I guess, a universality about that. But there's, it's also about ambition and family and friendship and sex and marriage and all those things that we do have some understanding and recognition of. But it, it's obviously more than that because of the chronology, which it's not just a device. It has a way of stimulating the audiences to be intensely engaged, I think. It creates an ambiguity for all of us and the actors. And I think that's the thing, that language creates an ambiguity. There's a richness in it of potential interpretation as well, which means there's something more there to get a hold of, both as a performers and audience, than just a straight telling of an affair. It's, it's not a play about having affairs. That's just what happens in the play. It's, it's a play about that connection that we crave for between people, both sexual, but also kind of homosocial, to use that word, and between men, that need for yes. a bond, where there is no vocabulary, there is no structure by which that bond can be created. It's just through things like drinking, playing squash. talking about literature and, literature and playing squash, yeah. But it, that, isn't, that isn't a human interface, as it were, which is what's being sought but, but is lacking. So the play will mean different things to different people over time, and it, and it, and it will develop and become more rich in different ways. I think the, bet the betrayal, interesting, the most important betrayal might almost be not just of each other, although almost lose count of how many betrayals are going on if you work mm -hmm. out the schema of everybody involved in the play. But the most important ones ultimately are the betrayals of themselves and yes. what their hopes and expectations for their lives are be and how that plays out. Before we um, bring the curtain down today, Mark, one of the things we do in fixtures of our podcast is that I like to ask our guests to recommend another play that we could devote an episode to. Do you have another personal favorite that you could suggest we could talk about one day on our podcast? You know, I, I was thinking about this question. I was looking around what's going on in the world today, and I noticed that you've talked a lot about plays by white authors, and maybe it might be good to talk about a play by a black author. This isn't a very famous play, but it's an important play and a recent play. Ear to Eye by Debbie Tucker Green. It was at the Royal Course a couple of years ago. It speaks utterly to the moment we're going, going through, uh, certainly in the US, but also here, importantly as well, that, that issue of institutional racism and intergenerational responses to protest and to demonstration. Uh, so that's been on my mind a lot recently when seeing what's going on in the world. And I don't know if you would welcome that as an idea for the podcast because it's, doesn't, it's not a play that has got a very rich history, of course. No, well, the podcast um, is for both new and classic plays. So we're definitely interested in new plays. And I did see that at the Royal Court and thought a very powerful piece. And you talk about how, I mean, basically, what lessons have we learned? It's, you know, different generations still fighting the same battles uh, in terms of institutional racism. And, you know, that was incredibly dispiriting in some ways in that way, but very, very powerfully made. So um, a great suggestion. Thank you. As the curtain falls on our play today, on the graceless yet familiar behaviors of these adults in betrayal, what are we left with? Is it a warning of a kind that if we succumb to selfish temptations, we may betray not only others, but ourselves? Thanks for listening. Thank you, Mark. See you next time.
Thanks for listening. To listen to other episodes, to find out news about future episodes, or to leave comments about what you've heard, please visit us at www.theplaypodcast.com. You can also follow us on Facebook or on Twitter at The Play Pod. You're also welcome to email plays at theplaypodcast.com to suggest plays that we could talk about in future episodes. You can also register your suggestion on the website. Thanks again, and see you next time.